Well, greetings and welcome to Conversations About Autism. Today, we're going to be talking about levels of support for a medical diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. These levels of support were added to the most recent version of the diagnostic manual called the DSM. Uh, and that's what we use to diagnose autism. And so today we'll be talking about the reason these levels were added and what they mean. Uh, but first we'll be, do some brief introductions. And so I'll bring on the panel of experts uh, I have for you all today and uh, we'll do our intros. So I'll start by introducing myself uh, and the rest of you don't know, but I have a surprise question for you that I'm gonna have you answer. Um, uh, so I'll start off saying my name is Jennifer Mannheim and I am your host for this conversation. For my day job, I am a nurse practitioner at Seattle Children's Autism Center and at home I have two teenagers. Um, and uh, so that you get to know a little bit about me, uh, I'm going to share what superpower I would prefer to have if I could have one. And I'm gonna challenge each of our uh, panelists tonight to share theirs. So I'm giving you a moment to think. Um, but, uh, and I have to also disclose that, that this superpower came to me from one of my recent patients. They mentioned this and I thought, oh my gosh, this is what I want to. So the power would be to create ice cream by pointing my finger in a bowl and then out would come soft serve chocolate mint ice cream anytime I wanted. Uh, that would be my preferred superpower at the moment. And now I'm gonna to go to Gary. Uh, can you tell us about yourself and your preferred superpower? Well, sure, and thank you. And can you hear me okay, Jennifer? Uh, hi, hi, everybody, I'm uh, Gary Stoby, and I am calling in from my office at University of Washington where uh, I'm a adult neurologist by training. I spend most of my time uh, in clinical work uh, working with uh, neurodivergent and autistic adults and, and adults with other neurodevelopmental conditions. And my uh, superpower is pretty boring, uh, but it is the power to fly. My, uh, my uh, spirit animal is a pelican, uh, so I would really love to uh, probably fly and swim if you can give me that skill as well. So. Well, I think you can swim now. Probably Gary, but I can, uh, but not like a pelican, you know, <laughs> diving from the water, grabbing right, a fish okay. out of the water and stuff. Right. You know, so yeah. All right. We'll give you that. But that's good to know. Thanks, Gary. That tells us a lot about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how you want to analyze that, but yeah, you know, no, yeah. it's good. It's good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us tonight and or this uh, for the session. And Katrina, how about you? You want to tell us about yourself and uh and I know you're gonna have um someone else join you. So maybe tell us a little bit about them as well, too. Absolutely. Um, hello, my name is Katrina Davis, and I'm a parent, proud parent of an autistic young man who is going to be joining us tonight. Um, Arthur is 24, and um, uh, he is going to answer a few questions. And I, uh, speaking on behalf of him tonight, doing my very best to, uh, you know, share uh, what I know about him. I'm not autistic. So I can't give that perspective, but I'm giving the parent perspective of raising a really great guy since he was born many years ago. And so I look forward to sharing uh, support levels as it relates to Arthur. And he's going to share what he can tonight, too. Um, and he'll be joining us in a bit. Uh, I also work as a family advocate and a case manager for University of Washington and their Autism Echo Program through the Washington Include Network. And I also work at Seattle Children's uh, Emergency Department helping families who have autistic or uh, intellectually impaired loved ones who are in behavior crisis. So um, I have personal and professional experience with autism, but tonight I really want to relay the information I have from the parent perspective. And I'll, I could weave in what I know about the many families I support too, I guess too. Uh, okay, my, I'm, my spirit animal is a frog, okay? So, but I, my, my, my superpower is not related to a frog, although it would be so fun to swim like a frog in a pond, I think. But, but I, I, I'm gonna go to, um, this sounds, I mean, it sounds so righteous, like, but I really think it would be a great superpower to be able to give someone the power to, to know what it, to be in someone else's shoes, to know what it, to have that kind of deep empathy, that, to, to know what they're going through. I think the world would be a different place if that happened, probably a little better, <laughs> but yeah. Okay. That's, I love that. That's like a whole other level compared to ice cream, but, um, okay. but it's good too. So I'm glad you, you shared that. You make a good team. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, we're lucky to have you joining us tonight. Are you able to introduce yourself and share your power? 
Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is John Lima. I am a self advocate. Um, I work with the um, Echo Projects um, at the UW, and by day I am the advocacy manager for At Work. Um, and Dr. Stobie stole mine. Uh, <laughs> um, I think I would say that um, something that I've really been trying to make my superpower is learning how to capture audiences um, because I do a lot of public speaking. And when you look out at the first two rows, they're usually on their phones. Um, so really figuring out how to like harness um, words and influence to get people to pay attention to what you're saying. That is, yeah. And John, where are you calling in? You're coming calling in from kind of a cool place. Um, I am at our public library. I had a meeting before this and they have several quiet study rooms. Um, so I am in one of those. In Olympia, right? In Spokane. In Spokane. Okay. Wow. That's even um, further away, which is awesome. So we're covering the whole state here now, which is really cool. So um, thanks for joining us, John. Absolutely. Uh, and I love that superpower as well, too. That I, That's something I am constantly striving with um, as well. So, uh, all right. Now, um, Gary, I'm actually going to go back to you. And I'm hoping you can start us off by talking about um, how the levels of support kind of play into the diagnosis of autism. I know you have some slides. So when you're ready for those, just say the word and they will magically pop up. Um, but for those listening tonight who maybe have no, don't even know what we're talking about when we say levels of support, so just kind of starting at an entry level and, and tell us maybe a little history of how they came about or, or um, how we think about those medically. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. So, so I think um, the, this concept of levels of support uh, really comes from one of the biggest questions that folks have when an autism diagnosis is made uh, that you know that if we think about a classic time that diagnosis of autism is made it's made in early childhood and uh, the parents uh, I can almost guarantee or promise you that one of the questions in their mind is how severe is my child's autism uh, and and the reason they want to know that is they want to know, what's the outcome look like, you know, and, and, and how's, how's my child going to do over time? So this concept of severity was addressed through this levels of support comment in this most recent version of DSM. Uh, let me bring up the, let me bring up a slide uh, if we could, and I'll talk to a little bit about the DSM. So the diagnostic and statistical manual uh, is is the kind of the guidebook for psychiatry, um, and it is not meant to be a Bible. I use that term implying that it's not meant to be written in stone. It is it is a guidebook, and as you can see over the years, there have been new versions. And if we dive down specifically on the autism diagnosis, it has changed a lot over the years. Um, and I think that uh, I've observed in the recent diagnoses, and I, I, I go back all the way to showing my age. You know, I was in my residency and came into practice when DSM-3 was still uh, involved. So I got into practice in 1993 and DSM-4 came in 1994. Um, but when you look at, uh, when you look at DSM-3, it swung from this kind of more constrained diagnosis of autis uh, autistic disorder and then had this kind of vague pervasive developmental disorders and then and then it swung in DSM-4 to try to categorize that into subcategories of autism and Asperger's disorder and pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified and Rett syndrome and childhood disintegrative disorder. Um, after that we learned that we didn't really know what we thought we knew um, and that these categories like meshed and overlapped and 
and they weren't really helping us in the medical field that much. I do think they helped people um, in a lot of times, um, but but then a uh, reaction to that was DSM-5, which kind of brought it all together again into what we call autism spectrum disorder. Um, but then they still tried to help people um, better understand w where in the spectrum <laughs> a person is. And, and uh, uh, they chose to use uh, certain qualifiers, including levels of calling levels of support rather than calling it severity level. Um, and uh, I, I like that. I, I like that term with levels of support. And, and I find it useful as a provider, um, you know, to be able to tell to Katrina, who's in the emergency department, you know, working with somebody, oh, yeah, I know that guy, he's a autism with level three supports. And, and uh, so Katrina knows that that's somebody that has more profound forms of uh, more, more requires more supports to function in the home, in the community and in their school. Um, and when you uh, now DSM six, is probably going to react to lumping it, and it's going to probably try to split it again. And then DSM-7 will probably try to lump it again. And so, so just understand, it, it, the lumpers and the splitters, they, there's, a, there's a yin and a yang that just always occurs. This is true in medicine and in psychiatry in general, and it's especially true in this area. Um, so the splitters, if I really wanted to split in my diagnosis, I'd say autism spectrum disorder, level one, two, or three, I'd say with or without intellectual disability. I'd say with or without expressive language impairment. I'd say with or without an underlying genetic syndrome. And all of those things tell my medical colleague more information in a pretty short period of time. So I, as a medical provider, like, like that improvement. Um, I think we're gonna talk about some of the areas that it causes more confusion with levels. It hasn't solved all of our issues about having a really good understanding of the person based on the label. Um, I don't think the label ever captures the person. Um, and, and, you know, so, so I don't, you know, I, I still think there's lots of room for improvement, but at least as a provider, it's helped me somewhat with that. Um, maybe I'll stop there, Jennifer and Lau, but I, I think you and I talked earlier about some of the things that I want to highlight on some of the the things like over time and within the day, but I'll, maybe I'll talk about that later. Yeah, uh, no, I'll have you share that later, but maybe on our, our next slide, let's go back one more to the slide. And um, um, as we talked about those levels of support, and yeah. I think it could be helpful to visualize what we mean when we're talking about those levels of support. Do you want to just walk us through a little bit here? Yep. Or Yeah, yeah, that's great. So uh, this is pulled from, uh, abstracted from the DSM. Mm -hmm. And there's three levels. And so one is level one is requiring support. So that's the least supports. Level two requiring substantial support and level three requiring very substantial support. I suppose they could have put level four requiring very, very substantial, but they decided not to do that. Um, so uh, um, and, and they div you divide it. If you, Again, that's a good point. If formally, if you're going to do it really formally, you level both the the the, I'm going to use a, a negative term, deficits in social communication. So the, dif the difficulties related to social communication. Uh, and then the other side of the, the other symptom uh, grouping called restricted and repetitive behaviors, those are also leveled. So the point being there is you could have one person that is actually very social and has good verbal ability and doesn't require a lot of uh, support uh, doesn't require that much support on the social communication side, but might have real difficulty with transitions and might have really terrible sensory sensitivities and might really get frustrated and angry and have a meltdown with transitions in certain areas. Um, and so you, that person on that side would have require more levels of support, right? And then you could imagine another person that is that is non-speaking and and prefers a lot of time to be alone, um, but doesn't have sensory issues and maybe tolerates transition better. And so they would be 
requiring more supports on the social communication side. So, uh, so that's that's kind of the formal way it is done in in the DSM. Uh, does that make sense to those that are listening? I know. Yeah. Yes. No. I, okay. I think uh, I see John nodding his head. At least. Yeah. yeah. No. Okay. I, I, uh, I think you did a good job describing that there and, and how it can vary. And and uh, another question I get also is like, do these change over time? Like, once you're given a level, like, does that stay forever? And and you know, we'll talk maybe about what these levels look like in the future. But do these change? Is what do you? Yes. Gary. Yes, they change. Um, yes, they change, and they uh, they change over time. Uh, in if chronologically year by year, they but they in any one individual they can change within a day. In a day, like you can, you know, you you people that are autistic will tell you how their speech and language when they're tired can get or when they get frustrated or anxious can get a lot worse. Uh, you know, so that's one of the places where this does fail because it is not stagnant as you're kind of kind of asking that question, Jennifer. And that's the it's a it's a really good point because these aren't stagnant and we worry. I will tell you, we worry on the medical side that the people that pay for supports will that that a lot of times are looking to save money. Um, we worry that they look at these levels and that they will not provide supports, even though we want people to require less supports. Right. You know, so so there's this practical kind of gamesmanship that that goes into these two that that sometimes you have to be very frank and open with your medical provider about your concerns or if you also have those same concerns. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you, Gary. And I think a lot of people talk about these levels. And so I'm glad we're able to have a conversation about it because I'm, so I'm a level one autism or my kid's a level three. And, you know, what exactly does that mean? And there is a definition that goes with it. Um, but then there's also the lived experiences. And I know there are some there is some effort to to do away with these levels. Um, or maybe change them up in the next version, um, just because it doesn't really ever capture a person uh, fully just by by using these levels. So, um, yep. well, thank you, Gary. Uh, next, I was going to go with John, uh, and I'm wondering, John, if you would be willing to share kind of what for you as an autistic self advocate um, and an adult where you are as far as your level of support and kind of how you see yourself. And then maybe even if you want to talk a little bit about how that has changed over time for you. Sure. Um, so right now, really the only level of support that I receive is really just mental health counseling. Um, my parents drug me kicking and screaming um, so that I would be a what they call high functioning adult. Um, and so really just having access to mental health counseling, um, medication that works really well. Um, actually just had some changes to that. Um, it really been all it needed as an adult. Um, over time that's changed. Um, when I first started in this field in 2005, um, I joined a lot of boards and commissions and had to learn a lot about um, how to travel on my own. Um, and that was something that was really difficult for me. Um, and it took about two years of going through SeaTac and other airports by myself until um, I finally realized um, that I could handle doing that. Um, and so um, kind of, you know, having that natural support from people um, really has been helpful. Um, kind of sliding back um, to when I turned 18, I was in high school. At that time, I had DDA services and um, my parents and I were not each other's biggest fans, and um, I ended up living with a friend until they got me into an adult family home. Um, and I went through probably three or four of those in a two-year period because I didn't like the structure. Um, at one point in my last adult family home, 
um, the caregiver was actually older than the oldest resident who um, lived there. And um, they had a lot of rules and I didn't really like that. Um, and so I found my way into a program for homeless young men through Volunteers of America. Um, and they are no longer in existence. They rely heavily on some McKinney Vento funding that has um, been cut back. Um, but basically, I moved into a place called Flaherty House. Um, the staff there taught me everything I needed to know to be independent. Um, they got me my first housing voucher. Um, when I got my first apartment, I moved in right next door. Um, they had a, a complex group right next door to the house, and staff came over and checked on me frequently. And um, I think my biggest issue over time has been cooking. Um, I cannot do that well. Um, now, as an accommodation, I have a Tavala Smart Oven. Um, and so I can buy groceries that are programmed to that. And all I have to do is scan a barcode, press start, and it knows how long to cook the item for. And so that, that's been really helpful. And I hope as DDA waivers change, that we can get some of that technology into the hands of people. Um, I do worry about that though, because when, when people tend to have those types of accommodations, DDA thinks their care hours can go down. Um, and so there, there needs to be a balance between a person's need and assistive technology, but also having, making sure that they have enough care hours to get their needs met. Um, going back further to school, um, we moved to, I'm adopted, so we moved from England. I was in an Air Force family, um, and I was immediately put into um, mainstream classes, um, and I had to repeat second grade because I was so far behind. Um, and it was about that time that my parents got me assessed by the school, got on an IEP, stayed on an IEP throughout. Um, and for most of my K-12, I was in what we would call a resource room. Um, and then in my high school years, I had some significant behavioral issues and got put in designed instruction. Um, when I turned 18, that changed because I was able to um, have a little bit more agency over my IEP. Um, the teachers weren't taking input from my parents. And um, I got into some elective classes that I wanted. Um, I did fight for a one-on-one -on -one aid. I did not get it. Um, and... From there, I was able to get into a transition program um, called Community Images for Smoking Public Schools. And um, they really helped make sure that we understood how to navigate the community, um, taught us how to budget, taught us things that were important for work. Um, and I'll talk about work. Um, over the years, support has looked a little bit differently. Um, I have a really good job now where um, my employer realizes that writing is not my forte. Um, and so they provide a lot of accommodations. Um, people pre-check my work. I use a software called White Smoke, which is powered by AI. And um, it goes a lot deeper than some of your regular grammar checkers. Um, checks for things like sentence structure, split infinite, infinitives, um, things like that. So um, over time, I've been able to work some of that um, AI into my work. I'm just waiting for them to make a plug-in for Microsoft Outlook so that my emails get a little bit better. <laughs> so that's pretty much the level of support that I've required over the years. Yeah, well, thank you, John. And, um, 
I was just going to give a quick shout out. I know Katrina is going to go grab Arthur soon because his part's coming up. And I know that he, Arthur needs a little time to transition. So I was just going to give a cue for her um, standing up. And um, just real quick, John, you had uh, you mentioned DDA. But for those that aren't listening, do you want to just tell us what DDA is? Yeah, so um, DDA is the Developmental Disabilities Administration. And they provide um, a whole plethora of services to people who are eligible. Um, over time, I lost that eligibility. Um, and so um, I no longer have those services, nor do I need them. Nor do you need them, yeah. And, and um, Katrina, I thought you had said something about DDAs taking away actually the, the levels of support requirement. Um, there, what's that? That DDA is taking away those levels of support requirements. Is that right? Oh. Yeah, they don't look at severity. They look um, at adaptive functioning. And the DDA will be eliminating the IQ qualifier, cognitive scores, in 2025, January. That's in the state of Washington. Can we? Um, yep, we're almost done. We're going to do this. Um, so, Great yeah, time. they're changing the criteria for eligibility, and it's a work in My progress. Is... Well, let, let's, I, I think, are we ready? Let's yes. do it. Let's okay. do it. All right, thank you, John. We're going to come back to you in a bit. But first, we're going to, uh, next, we're going to talk to Arthur. Day, Virgin meets Father Day of Old Age. Well, I'd like to introduce Arthur. This is Arthur Conroy. Father. And Arthur, you recognize some people on this screen? Yes. Who do you see there? Who's our, who's our friend? Gary Stobie. Yeah, I'm Gary Stobie. We know Gary. And there's Jennifer and John. So these are people, um, Arthur, that we're learning about. We're talking about autism. Yes. And I want to thank you for just taking a minute to tell us a little bit about yourself, okay? Yes. So you know how we like to do these where you fill this in? Yes. Would you fill those questions in first yes. and then read them out? Yes, first? yes. Okay. All, my name is Arthur. Okay. Excellent. Uh, Katrina, would now be a good time just to show some pictures of Arthur? My name is A-R-T-H-U-R, Arthur. Okay. Why don't you, and then why don't you fill, uh, fill out that next question? Oh, he likes these pictures. Well, we, we go ahead and look at them. There you are. Throughout the years, Arthur. Um, Arthur. What makes me happy? What makes you happy? Going to the, going to the grocery store. Okay. Going. I think you saw that picture on there where going, he's lining up grocery. Where he used to he used to put the cereal boxes. Going in a port. <laughs> going. You can just write grocery store. That's okay. grocery store. Grow, grow. Nice. Sure. Going grocery. Okay. And then let's not look at the picture. What do you, what, 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 what's that? We can put the slide back down. Yeah, I think it's. makes me sad. Hmm. Hmm. What makes me sad? Is there something that makes you sad sometimes? What? Miss. Ivona. Oh, that's grandma. Oh, Mrs. Ivona. I miss, I miss Ivona. Oh, that's going to make me cry. Um, I miss her too, buddy. Um, okay, the next question is kind of a fun question, and we talk about this a lot. Gaslight. All right. So our, the, the question is, my job will be, and Arthur worked for a while at a restaurant called Gaslamp in Issaquah when he was just going to school over there. So there's a picture. Uh, there, there's a picture there where Arthur's working. So in the next slide. But Arthur, I just want to thank you for these. Let's see your, let's see your, your handwriting. Arthur works really hard uh, for his handwriting over the years. Um, and it helps us communicate. Arthur, I want to thank you very much. Is there anything mm -hmm. else you want to say to the folks here? No. Okay, I'm going to need um, this room right now. <laughs> we'll do our best here. Uh, okay, he's, oh, thanks, buddy. Four years of yeah, four Thanks, years, Arthur. Four years of piano. Um, thanks, Mom. Thanks, Arthur. Thank you. All right. Um, so I, I think it's really important that I say right now that I did ask Arthur in a way that I think he would understand if I could talk about him tonight. And he said yes. So um, I said, you know, we're going to talk about how much support you need in life to do the things you want to do and be the person you want to be. So I, I asked him in a way I think he understands. And so I want I want to just let people know I really value that he be a, that he be part of the discussion in a way he can be. And tonight, I think he felt like he was part of the discussion. So thank you. Um, but let me talk a little bit about Arthur. The question being, you know, right, Jennifer, like levels of support Arthur needs and what's changed over time? Yeah. Is that okay? Yes. Well, I'll just start off by saying, because 
levels of support, sometimes we talk about negative things. Like Gary was saying, there's a lot of there's a lot of words we use that are that are sound really negative, and they can be. They're negative words. Because I'm going to talk about high levels of support that, that are for things that he, you know, that can be challenging for him. Um, but I will I will start out and just say that, you know, Arthur is one of the kindest people I know. He's very thoughtful. He's very caring. He's brave. He works harder than anyone I know in this world to be in this world. It's very overwhelming for him. Um, and he goes at it with great resilience. He's interesting. He's funny. The guy has a great sense of humor. Lately, um, he sings to me in the car and he inserts the word Yoshi, the Mario character, you know, like girls just want to have fun. Yoshi just wants to have fun. Um, hey, Jude. Hey, Yoshi. And he's cracking me up the whole time. He's got a nice voice, too. So it's been pretty fun to have that that keen wit um, and see that because I think that's a sign of happiness. Um, so uh, Arthur, I, I would say, you know, the type of support Arthur needs, he's a level three. And I, and by, you know, I know that's such a squishy word and everything, but, you know, he's a consistent, I would say, baseline level three. And, and what that looks like for Arthur um, is, you know, he has his good days. And even on those good days, he's still very high supports. Um, a good day is when he's not dysregulated or agitated, usually from maybe anxiety. Sometimes it could be pain, could be hunger, could be hot. We don't know. He's not a great self-reporter. Arthur has excellent receptive skills, but challenge hard for expressive. And um, so, you know, he has an intellectual impairment. He has, um, you know, communication challenges, uh, social deficits. Another negative word there. Um, he and you know he can experience pretty significant challenging behaviors in his in his life ever since he was little. It was easy when he's little. It gets harder when they get bigger. And so these are all very negative words and negative things. And I know that. And um, so, but that's that's his reality. That's our reality. And it does require a high level of support and and some lots of effort. And and he, again, he works the hardest at all this. So um, he needs predictability. He needs routine. He needs stimulation. You know, Arthur loves going out in the world. Just like all of us, we have our things we prefer. And so if he doesn't have that, that can make for a bad day. And that's a fair request, <laughs> right? Getting out in the world. Um, he loves to participate in his community. Um, he likes to make decisions for himself. So we look for every opportunity to include him in those decisions. And if he doesn't want to do it, sometimes the answer is sure, no problem. Sometimes, yeah, we have to go to the grocery store today. Or yeah, we got to, you know, we got to do some chores. So, um, you know, that Arthur surrounds himself with people that love him and um, things he likes to do and, and people that he loves. He has his people. That's a big part of, I think, of his support. Um, medications are a support. They keep him between the ditches. <laughs> um, they keep his challenging behaviors. Sometimes um, they can help with his challenging behaviors. They can reduce his anxiety, uh, which can contribute to being edgy, can, which can lead to significant challenging behaviors. And when I say challenging behaviors, I'm not like, Go to your room, time out. It's pretty serious. It can be self-injury. It can be it can be aggression towards others that has required medical attention. It can be property destruction, significant property destruction, and bolting from the family home in, into unsafe places across the street, things like that. So those are pretty serious behaviors. And by the way, when those behaviors happen, his world gets really small fast because we can't leave the house. And that's so isolating for him. So when there's challenging behaviors, we all grieve, no one more than him. But, and by the way, when he does have a significant challenging behavior, he has a lot of remorse. And um, again, hard for all of us, but no, no, no one suffers more than him from that. Um, it's a manifestation of his disability, <laughs> challenging behaviors. It's not something that he does to, um, you know, get attention. You know, sometimes there's reasons for these behaviors. Sometimes we just don't know. Um, other supports for Arthur look like gestures and prompts. I don't like to bark at him all day. Put your clothes on, get your coat. I'll just sort of point at the coat. If he's walking out of the house and it's cold, he's not wearing a coat. So I just sort of fade these prompts, but those are, that's support. Or else he might walk out without a coat on. Um, and, and then lots of countdowns and warnings. Okay, we're gonna leave in five minutes, three minutes, two minutes. Okay, we're leaving. Um, can't just, you know, take him quickly out of something. That, that's really dysregulating for him. Um, he can't cross the street safely. So we, and in the community, he, he doesn't understand safety. So we have to have someone with him and pretty close, close attention um, around safety issues. He can swim though. We worked really hard at that and he's a fish. So we don't worry about water as much anymore. Um, if he's dysregulated, he, he needs the line of sight care or he might hurt himself or someone else or something. Um, we can't leave him alone uh, and at this point. I, and I think that would just be uh, risky and, and, and there's dignity and risk, but that risk is too big. 
but there's lots of other risks we let him take. And that's part of his happiness too, is letting him take risks. And so we as parents have to always push that line between our comfort and what he wants. And uh, it's okay to feel uncomfortable, I've realized. I've learned that from my self-advocate friends. Um, and so then lastly, I think PRN, I said medications are really helpful for just what are what are kind of support are there needs in the world? Um, without these proper supports, we can go south fast. And this is, I was talking to his dad before um, we, we did this. And I said, um, he said, well, if I didn't give Arthur his meds this morning, and if we hadn't have done our outing, you, you wouldn't be sitting here doing this. And it's true. He can become dysregulated very fast. So it's, it's, it's diligence too. It's staying on top of it. Now, when you don't have help in the home, and I'm speaking to a lot of parents who are probably hearing this going, what help are you talking about? There's, it's hard to get help right now, folks. If you have a kid who's pretty high or a loved one who's high needs, uh, uh, level three challenging behaviors, um, it's hard to find caregivers, respite programs, specialized debilitation services, job coaches, all these things. People don't have challenging behaviors expertise. They know autism or they know intellectual disability, but they don't, they're not behavior specialists. So that's, again, the world gets really small. And um, I'm always going to be a broken record about the importance, the vital importance of these services need to happen for this population. They're marginalized right now. They're excluded a lot of time. And it's very isolating. And it leads to depression because they're isolated in the home. Small circle. Um, Jennifer, I, I'm, gonna, I'm making sure. I, I think the next question is, is about when he was younger. So I'm going to stop there. You're going to stop there. OK. Yeah. OK. So, um, you know, uh, listening to you, I, I know both, full disclosure, I know everyone on, on this panel here, uh, mm -hmm. known them over the years and learned a lot from, from all of them and uh, learned something new about John tonight uh, about him. Um, but the thing I just wanted to reflect on um, and speaks to kind of these levels of support is that both for Arthur and for John, you know, it's the people having your people around who support you. Um, and doesn't matter kind of what level you are, you need that support. Um, medications was something both John and uh, Arthur used to kind of help um, in regulation and, and that kind of thing. And then there's also the um, behavioral support. And for John, it's like mental health counseling with a counselor. And then for for Arthur, it's it's other kinds of behavior support. But what's really challenging for Arthur is finding those people who have that knowledge um, in, in how to do that. But I just wanted to point out that it's the same types of support. Um, and, and for Arthur, a lot of it is, is when he's dysregulated, it's 24 seven line of sight. Um, but I think it can also be quite hard. I mean, John also, I know has gone through phases in his life uh, just because I know some things about John where where his need for people to reach out and help uh, became greater when other supports weren't there to help. Is that fair to say, John, without oversharing? <laughs> no, okay. Um, so just just kind of acknowledging that this level of support, I think it does help us understand that you know Arthur is needing kind of as Gary was alluding to, and it's a it's a short speak way we have of communicating in the medical world. But when we when we step out of that, it doesn't always fully describe, you know, level one doesn't mean somebody doesn't need support. They do need support. Uh, and so that's that's kind of just just wanted to call those similarities out. I think that's that's just one thing I wanted to acknowledge. Um, but I did want to transition next and and think a bit about um, how these levels of support change over time. And Gary, you were kind of talking about that a lot of parents and, and individuals themselves and in, in getting a diagnosis, knowing like, what's this gonna look like in five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, is my, is my kid gonna need support the rest, you know, line of sight, 24 hour care, or are they gonna, you know, become president? It's hard to know like uh, where, where things will be. And um, so Gary, I was wondering if you might be able to, to talk more broadly about like what this means outcome wise for, for autistic individuals. Um, when they get these these levels of support when they're diagnosed and and what that means. That sure. <laughs> no, well, well, I think that that I kind of said at the beginning, you know, I kind of implied that there's this kind of elephant in the room question that folks have of that's related to like what's what's the outcome look like? Tell me, what's the crystal ball show me? 
you know, and, and there's a natural inclination to think that the level one requiring less supports, you know, is on a better track. Right. And, and I think that's true in general, but not perfect and it doesn't define it. And so, you know, having a three-year-old child that is labeled by their diagnostician as level three, that does not tell you for sure what's going to, what, what that person's going to be like as an adult. Okay. And so that, that's an important thing for parents and families and individuals to, to hear that. Right. So, so when we look at, when we look at outcomes in autism, um, part of our problem is this, is that it's extremely broad. You know, we've got individuals that, you know, uh, like Albert Einstein, that probably if he was young now would, would have been a level one autistic, um, you know, that went on and discovered amazing things, right. And was, and had this amazing outcome and, and, uh, you know, we've got other individuals that require 24 seven support through their adult life. Um, and what are the things that tell us which direction we're going, you know? So, so I think that's it. I, I don't, I, I, although I think in, in early childhood, the leveling probably of, of the kind of core autism symptoms, those are factors and variables that, that do influence outcomes. So we do know, for instance, individuals that are not making progress in expressive language and have more difficulties in expressive language, that is a variable that, that influences outcome. We know, we know that individuals that are struggling with a, adaptive skills and that, get, that, that ultimately receive a, the, the label of intellectual disability, uh, that's, a, that's a sign of, of requiring more supports likely in, in adult years, okay? So, so again, not perfect, but, but do, do influence that. But then there are these other factors that aren't part of the core diagnosis that absolutely also affect the supports. So for instance, um, a, a person that develops a co-occurring mental health condition, okay, likely is now going to require much more supports for managing that co-occurring mental health condition. A person that develops a co-occurring medical condition like severe sleep disturbance or epilepsy, that person is going to require more support. Some of those very traditional medical supports like medications, some of those might be new behavioral strategies or new supports in their life, uh, you know, uh, to help them manage their sleep or to help them manage their gastrointestinal symptoms or other things. So, so how does that, how do, how do we calculate all that into the leveling of autism? Do we, when we give the level for autism, do we, do we also take into account all of these other factors? There's some debate in that, in our, in our field. Um, so, uh, so it definitely, you know, the, it, it, it does influence, but it's, but it's not a direct comparison. So you don't want, you don't want to, um, you don't want to assume uh, that you know everything at, uh, you know, when your child is three, four or five years old um, and uh, you, uh, you know, you want to definitely um, see progress, obviously, and you do worry when there's not progress. And that and, and so that that's where we we do want these ongoing evaluations. But but we we also get asked a lot of times to like. Hey, can you formally re-diagnose or reevaluate my child? Because I think he's now a level two instead of a level three. And I want to prove that to, I don't know, myself or whoever. Um, and we resist that, number one, because we've got like a multi-year wait list for doing the first diagnosis, let alone a second, third, or fourth diagnosis. Um, but also that's just kind of it's not that's not what we do in in our in our clinic. It that we we that you know, that leveling, we can do that just as easy through talking to you. And what are the level of supports that are needed? Well, that's the level that your child is at, you know. So uh, so we don't want to get wrapped into being tied and bound to these levels over time. Right. And, and school districts help a lot, too, often by, um, you know, they've got quarterly um, 
uh, reporting out progress and, and that kind of thing, and then yearly adjusting IEPs. And those are often measures that I use as a provider to kind of help me understand like, oh, they're not qualifying for speech anymore, or they're not qualifying. Mind you, sometimes we're advocating the opposite, right? That they're not making progress. And so therefore we yeah. need more of those supports, but when they yep. are, those are good indications. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, it's a great point. And this is a, this is a challenge that autism is, it challenges our, our kind of medical thinking because, you know, we think about, you know, there's the, there's the one comparison, which is like high blood pressure, right? Oh, um, I get put on high blood pressure medication. I don't have high blood pressure anymore. Oh, I guess I don't need the blood pressure medicine anymore. It's like, no, that's why your blood pressure is down. Right. right. Um, you know, and so that same argument of like, don't pull the support because they're going to regress and lose that. And that's true in some situations. Then there's other situations where the brain has grown and developed, right? And so in, for instance, in my adult clinic, we're, 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 we're reducing and eliminating medications in a lot of people um, because they'd been on a medication since they're 10 years old. And we're like, do you really need that anymore? You don't have a 10 year old brain anymore. You have a 25 year old brain. And sometimes we're able to come off of those, you know, because because the person has developed their own, their, their, their brain has grown and they've developed their own ability to, to accommodate and to support. Right. And so we don't need the medications as often. So um, anyway, yeah, the, it, it's a it's a challenging one because I totally understand the concern and the worry about pulling supports too early we do not want to do that right yeah and even thinking john's almost like the a, a great case and talking about your supports um john and uh i'm curious i'm going off script totally in all of this these conversations here uh but john for you as you no longer qualified for some of those services um they're like dda and other agencies um kind of how that went for you as they were like pulling back some of that support I think at first it was really difficult. Um, I really had to learn how to accommodate myself. Um, I think if I had services now, the only thing that I would really use them for would be for employment support. Um, so, um, because I was made eligible with what's called the ICAP, um, I was on the no paid services caseload for so long that I would either have to get a um, a higher diagnosis um, than what I had or just not request services. So, um, and we all know that once you've gotten services and benefits, any changes in diagnoses can upset the apple cart so it was at that point that i just decided you know i'm probably going to have to figure out how to accommodate and um, ask for the support that i need um, and that you know it's been really successful since um, losing services Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, John. Um, I will say the only state service that I have relied upon consistently is um, DVR. They helped me find um, my current job. Will you share with us what DVR is? And DVR is the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, I have been a customer of theirs three times. Um, once I was working towards self-employment, um, and then I got hired in an AmeriCorps position, um, and then the second time they helped me find a job with another agency, and the third time um, they helped me find a job with that work. Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing that. I talk with families a lot about it. But it's always good to hear from someone who's actually gone through it. Uh, and found that to be helpful. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, John. And uh, I think, uh, Trina, would now be a good time to maybe share a little bit more about, about Arthur's levels of support, how that's kind of changed over time and that trajectory mm -hmm. and how that when he was younger and now. Yeah. 
Well, I want to thank John first of just reminding me, you know, I'm listening to John talk about his, the things he used to accommodate some of his challenges like the Tovala oven and the white smoke, uh, you know, computer communication. Um, maybe I, I'd love to hear that. And I, I think you've got to keep talking about that to people because you're doing it. And I think that just the quality of life when you use those accommodations and you went out there and did the technology thing, it's so important that um, there's so much can I think going to happen with our popular, or my, you know, people like my son and you, where uh, those accommodations can really lead to quality of life. And so I just want to thank you for remember, reminding me also that Arthur wears headphones a lot. And that's, I think that's kind of that same thing. The world is really loud to him and he's a lot happier if he's got those headphones on. Um, I, um, I, so Arthur, you know, he's diagnosed at 20 months and I was that patient. I, Gary, Dr. Stubby wasn't our doctor, but I was saying, well, what is this? You know, <laughs> this is back in 2001, you guys, <laughs> you know, I got a yellow sticky that said autism and there was a line and he circled severe <laughs> this side of the line, you know? Um, and I was like, what, you know, Arthur's 20 months and it's like, wow. I mean, I, I, he did present pretty strongly. He had a lot of those markers. He, you know, we joked that he could have been diagnosed in the parking lot, walking on his tiptoes and, you know, you know, he's very autistic and beautiful. And, um, and it, but scary as a parent, of course, we're going to want to know that every parent wants to know that if and it's not because we think they're broken and it's more, we're scared that life's going to be hard for them. That's a parent. That's what we do. We want them to not suffer. Um, I never thought Arthur's autism was, I did not believe the cure or fix thing back then. It was pretty big back then. What I believed is it was his brain. It's his essence. So you don't change someone's essence. It's his identity. But you do give him all the help and strategy he needs to not have to rely on people, right? I don't want to trust my son's happiness and the kindness of strangers or systems that are undependable, <laughs> not dependable. So um, the more independent he can be, the less he has to rely on people. And so I've worked on with, we, we really focused on just Arthur being the best he could be, reaching his potential. Um, so with that, you know, diagnosed pretty young. So all the stuff you do, right? We did uh, right early intervention, developmental preschool, special education with an IEP and functional behavior assessments with behavior intervention plans and um, specialized classrooms, specialized instruction. Um, uh, outside, we did applied behavior analysis, speech therapy, occupational therapy, lots of community participation. Um, social skills when we could. That wasn't, a, didn't always work because that's a pretty big challenge for him. So we, we focused our energy on things that, that really, you know, bring out the best in him and, and help him be the person he could be. Um, so all those things, you know, they were a big part of uh, his supports was just the services. Now, DDA was a part of our existence, is a part of our existence, but Arthur was on the no paid services caseload, John, just for 10 years. So that was hard. We didn't get caregivers. We didn't get respite. And when we did get on a waiver, they call them waivers, um, those services are hard to get. And you heard me complain about that earlier, that there's not a lot of services for this higher need population. You know, there's not, there's no mandate these service providers have to serve this population. And frankly, if you get paid the same to serve someone who's a little easier, you do. So we've, we've got a lot of work to do to get this population. We got to seek to understand their needs. We have to understand them. We have to acknowledge that the higher needs population exists and that their needs, the supports and services are different than what we are proposing. We have to be uh, not afraid to seek different services and come up with different services. The square peg round hole is not working. An example I might give is um, ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis is covered by Medicaid. It's covered by private insurance for the most part. But most of the ABA providers that are out there do skill acquisition with young kids, communication skills, following directions, waiting in line, these things that are more skill acquisition, a lot of them don't have experience with challenging behaviors, and that's where we need the help right now with this population. So we we need to adapt the services and support to meet the needs of this group and not be afraid of it because it looks different. And we have to step outside the comfort zone and do things that are a little differently. And sometimes the answer is that people don't agree on the answers, and that's sometimes the problem. But we won't go there today. <laughs> it's complex. It's very complex. Um, Could you yeah. not would it be helpful to throw up some pictures of Arthur? I was just thinking as you were describing him as a little yeah. woman than as he is now. Yeah, like, I'll just I'll end with, yeah, there you go. There's a little span. Yeah, Arthur. Right. Thinking as I, you were describing him as a little tyke. Yeah, he was a little guy. He was, we called him the governor there. And he's this little baby picture. He's always just posted up and smiling at everybody. Um, you know, and then this picture on the far right where he's looking very unhappy. Those were the hard years. During his teen years, we had a really tough time, like a lot of like a lot of autistics do, the world got really overwhelming for him. I think he was traumatized by some things that happened in his life. 
that were really hard for him. And he, he has a tough time. So he was a very unhappy guy for about three years, really tough years. Um, I, I just, I just love the guy, but I want to say that um, some other things that supports for Arthur, and as we think about this kind of level three supports, I have white hot fear. I'm, I'm not going to live forever. Not that I need to be the one to care for him forever. In fact, I wouldn't want my mom to care for me forever. I want him to be as independent as he can be. And that might mean an adult family home or a supported living, you know, something. But we've got we've got to create these homes for the folks. Right now, we have a real housing and residential shortage problem for this population, for everybody, frankly. But this population, it's really bad in Washington. Um you know, we need we need uh, vocation supports for him, community participation, connection to caring people, safety, health care. I want him to make his own decisions. So we got to create opportunities for him to take those risks we talk about. All that comes with a lot of scaffolding and services and sports, funding, policy, all these things that right now, every one of those areas I mentioned, we're struggling. And um, I know, and I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer here, but I, I think there's a lot of good things happening in our state, but we have a lot of work to do for this population. Um, so I, I hope that that kind of addresses, I will say there's a picture, when Arthur smiles, he lights up the room and he loves Chuck E. Cheese. Chuck E. Cheese, just loves that guy, always have. <laughs> He's dancing with him there. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'll stop there because I know we're running out of time, but um, no, no, yeah, no. He, yeah. What I did want to give a, a shout out about is that, um, you, uh, people don't know watching here tonight, but you have been very active, uh, to, as well as John, mm -hmm. in trying to move the needle legislatively um, to really support individuals with autism at all levels of the spectrum, truly. Yeah. And um, I know a lot of parents worry about the things you were just talking about when they have a, have a, pers a, a child with high support needs or someone they take care of. Uh, caregivers um, uh, worry about these things, but um, I will say there are people who are passionate about, like yourself and John, like Katrina and John, uh, who are working on this to try it, and Gary Stoby as well too, actually, uh, are very much involved in, in trying to get more of those kinds of supports in place. Um, I know we, we've got a little, a few more minutes here for sure, and Gary, um, I wanted to, um, See if you wanted to maybe share the uh, those slides. Would those things still make sense? You think, or I think we kind of covered those topics. What do you think? The trajectory. Oh, you're on mute, Gary. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we necessarily need the slides, but but I think um, you know one of the I, I want to bring back and highlight uh, one of the things that John said, because this is this is a challenge for everybody and it's individualized with every individual. But John really stated, you know, uh, very poignantly uh, that it was hard initially when those supports were pulled. Right. Um, yet the flip side of that coin is he it sounds like he gives some credit to that to where he is now. Right. And and so that that is really important for everyone to hear, right? I think that's important for autistic self advocates, those of you that identify as autistic out there, and it's important for families of of people that are, are autistic or diagnosed with autism. Um, it, it is a uh, you and your point, Katrina. You, you uh, certain times you have to take risk, right? And the hard thing is, is like, there's no perfect absolute right or wrong, right? And, and these are, and as, as parents and as people in general, we have, we face decisions like these all the time, right? Like, where am I going to send, am I going to send my kid to public or private school? Or am I going to, you know, which daycare are they going to go? And we, we make risky decisions where they're outside of our power and control. And that's scary as a parent. Um, as a person, when you uh, you know when you take away supports, that's scary. Um, uh, yet sometimes these are helpful in the long run. So so it, it, I, there's no absolute right or wrong in there. There's no like the, the message is that these are important. These are important decisions and they're hard decisions. Um, but as uh, um, as a, a friend and self-advocate that I know of mine once said, we can do hard things. And so we, we have to sometimes do hard things because those help us get to the places that we want to be. Um, but we got to be safe. So 
remember that, you know, the safety rules, safety overrules everything, you know, so, um, and we have to, we, we as providers really need to do a better job of listening. Yeah. And I thank uh, my families and I thank my patients who uh, are self-advocates and, and uh, for helping me understand this better. I think it's helped me both as a provider and it's helped me as a person. So well said, Gary. If, if I had once, your superpower, Gary, is sometimes stating things and summarizing them in ways that everyone goes, yeah, that's just about right. Um, so I just wanted any, any final thoughts from Katrina or Davis, Katrina Davis or John Lemus? <laughs> uh, I'll just say that I really agree with Katrina. I think the service system needs to do a better job of adapting for people over their lifespan. Um, you know, right now we're looking at um, people not having a lot to do during their day, um, especially folks with higher support needs. Um, and that has really gotten me as someone who works for a supported employment provider thinking about the whole idea of what a meaningful day program would look like. Um, and so I get to go visit with um, one of our partners, Tabon, um, to go talk about that. Um, but I think that that's something that DDA should have seen coming. Um, I think that we need to do a better job of anticipating what the needs are. Um, we do a really good job of supporting people when they're young. Um, there are all sorts of programs out there and then when they become adults, the amount of support and services that are out there are very, very slim. Um, and so that, that would be my one wish that the service system kind of figure out how to adapt to, um, to the times as they change and what people's needs are. You know, John, the, one of the things we're, you know, we all want DDA to do forecasting, developmental disability, just to forecast. And that's, that's on a lot of radars. That could be a good thing. So you're right about, about that. And I will say some of the tragedy we're seeing from the lack of services and support, the years of that, is um, the high, a high rate of out-of-state placement. We just don't have the services in state. We are, children, teens, and adults are leaving the state uh, away from family, home, community, everything they know, because we're not able to do that here. Um, and that's, I, Washington can do better. And I, and I know everybody agrees with that. So it's work to do. Well, thank you guys. And you left, you gave us some good ideas and some thoughts and, and kind of where we need to go in the future. And uh, it's parents and voices and providers and, and advocates all working together that, that hopefully will make those changes and make this happen. And um I, I see a bright future ahead, especially knowing these people I work with and the families I meet that we will continue to see change and things will will make will make progress in these areas. I'm certain um, it'll look different. Who knows what the DSM six or seven will be? But um, I think that that I'm hopeful and I hope all of you are, too. So uh, I want to thank you so much for participating and sharing your stories and your your. Um, oh, there we go. I've got my timer telling me it's about time. So. Thank you guys, um, best wishes to those watching and please uh, check out our website and uh, send us some, some thoughts if you have some other ideas of topics we can talk about. Thank you.